thank uh, uh, Professor uh, Mancini and Dr. Tr uh, Trinkus for uh, for inviting me to speak uh, uh, at this uh, workshop. It's always wonderful to be uh, in Rome. It, it really is. It's wonderful to be here. But it's especially wonderful when you think about what you've left behind. You know, let's see, where's this thing here? Boom. Uh, this is... Uh, this is my house right here. Before we get started, that's my house there. This is what was a garden before we got buried under eight feet of snow. Uh, there's the little walk that we cleared. It looks like a trench in World War One. You know, passion day or something. So walking through the trench, it was felt like a war. There's a lot of snow right there too. Uh, oops, I got a point at this ball, don't I? Oh, and there's this little picture of myself there with my trusty shovel. Let me tell you, that got a lot of use. It's a great exercise here. And this is. Uh, and you can see this is the top of this mountain right here. It's a, white, a lot taller than me, I tell you that. And this is after our third blizzard. There was one more that got it about that high. It buried all of these trees eventually. So this is what it looks like now. It still does. We have another storm scheduled for today. I'm glad to be in Rome. <laughs> uh, <coughs> my talk uh, today is sort of a mixture of experimental uh, work. And um, with clinical subjects, however, you know, Graham had mentioned earlier about experimental psychopathology in one, in one sense as being uh, studying the processes in healthy individuals and then extrapolating them and providing that as a springboard for base, basing it where things have gone wrong with patients. We will be actually with clients, but a couple of experimental studies and also uh, some work on network analysis as well, which is a, a non-experimental uh, work. But, uh, whoops. Yeah, uh, I, I want to acknowledge uh, two of my PhD students um, who've been very much involved in this research, as you see, and often the first authors on some of it, Don Robinaugh uh, and also uh, Nicole LeBlanc. And the first, um, uh, the first study we did here uh, 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 concerned complicated grief. Uh, and I want to just give a little bit of just clinical background on this syndrome. It is not uh, an official diagnosis in the DSM-5. However, it does occupy this position as uh, conditions requiring further study. So we figured, we'll study it. We'll follow it up. Uh, so we're dealing with a, not an official diagnosis, but one that nevertheless has some DSM-5 criteria to it. Now, of course, complicated grief has been called prolonged grief, a traumatic grief. Uh, uh, um, it's gone by a number of different terms. So people working in this area have sort of converged on a, um, a, a sort of a set of symptoms that have been embodied in the DSM-5. Now, the, uh, the DS, DSM-5 committee, being what it is, has always got to make things more complicated. So now this is called PCBD. PC, yes, PCBD. Uh, persistent Complex Bereavement Disorder. That's the same. That's complicated grief. So I'm going to use those two terms uh, uh, inter interchangeably. Uh, first of all, obviously, the, the criterion A here is, is uh, the, a loss of a loved one. Uh, although I should say parenthetically, is a lot of individuals who says, well, you know, why do you folks, uh, the clinical psychologists, uh, confine it to only to the death of a loved one? Would you see a similar sort of syndrome uh, arising in people who've lost a, a beloved job or, or, or a pet or all kinds of different things uh, uh, or have lost some, something very important to them uh, might they also show these symptoms? But uh, that has not been, to my knowledge, studied. So we're really talking about bereavement here. Um, and uh, the criterion B is the a persistence of at least one of the following. So uh, yearning uh, after the, the lost loved one, and the sense of emotional pain, it's sort of a physical embodiment of, of negative emotion, which I should add, you know, interestingly enough, darn near did not make it into the diagnostic criteria. Uh, it's a good reason that it did, as, as we'll see a little bit later. Um, preoccupation uh, with, with the person who's passed away. Preoccupation with the death, particularly in cases of, of traumatic deaths, uh, uh, can be quite salient. Uh, and then at least uh, a six of, of the following, a whole long set of symptoms here. So it's really quite, quite a much a, a, a grab bag. A market difficulty accepting the death, a disbelief or emotional numbness. And by the way, those are two different things. Uh, why they're combined in the same symptoms, uh, odd. But anyway, uh, difficulty with positive re reminiscing. Uh, so uh, having a hard time th thinking about some of the good times that you had with the person who's passed away. A sense of bitterness. Um, 
and maladaptive self appraisals you know blaming yourself for all different sorts of things that you didn't know at the time why didn't i tell this person not to do that such and such uh i should have told him to go to the doctor earlier if he was having these symptoms and now he has cancer and is we could i could have stopped it etc things like this where at the time you may not have really had the knowledge to do that avoidance of reminders uh, of the person uh, and then also uh, among this long list is a desire to die to be with the deceased, a difficulty trusting others, loneliness, life seems meaningless, diminished identity, There's some sense that you know oneself is, is gone, a sort of uh, the, the part of you is missing in virtue of that that relationship that's no longer uh, present, difficulty planning for the future. Uh, now, um, well, one of the controversies about the diagnosis is, is, is where do we sort of draw the line between distress and disorder? And the DSM-5 folks were trying to do this by um, uh, uh, you're pointing out that these symptoms must cause clinically significant distress. And quite frankly, that seems redundant. If you have all these symptoms, you sure certainly are distressed. Um, but also impairment in social, occupational, or other aspects of functioning. And the reaction must be out of proportion or inconsistent with cultural, religious, or age-appropriate norms. Again, this just shows you how difficult this is, nailing this down. But suffice it to say, people are indeed suffering who have this problem, and it also places them at risk for all kinds of medical morbidities down the road. Okay, in the first study uh, that we did was an experiment uh, concerning autobiographical memory, envisioning the future, and complicated grief, grief after spousal uh, bereavement. And uh, we began with some observations originally made by Mark Williams, uh, uh, the British psychologist who discovered the phenomenon of overgeneral memory on uh, what's been called the AMT, or autobiographical memory test. test. Uh, the AMT, uh, what happens here is you give somebody a... Um, a simple uh, word, uh, uh, such as uh, happy, for example, you give the person a thing of a specific memory, an event that lasted no longer than a day, that's prompted by the word happy. So if I were to get the word happy, I might say, ah, I was really happy on February the 2nd when I was watching the New England Patriots win their fourth Super Bowl in the most dramatic fashion. I could go on, but I'll spare you. Um, and and so, so that would be a very specific memory that occurred on this day. Now, by contrast, the overgeneral memories come in two different types. You can have uh, categorical memories. So if I were to say, I'm always happy when I'm watching the New England Patriots. So a category. Assuming they win, which they do a lot. Please do report. Uh, or an extended memory that stretches over more than a day. So I have to say, well, I was really happy during the fall of 2014 watching their march to the Super Bowl. Okay, now, what happens with this, though, so with depressed folks and people with PTSD, uh, we found this with Vietnam veterans with combat-related PTSD some years ago, um, we've, uh, uh, they have a hard time retrieving specific memories from their past. And this parenthetically is a predictor of difficulty recovering from conditions such as depression. So it's clinical significance. Uh, we, we found it also appearing in people with OCD and our OCD patients, but as long as they were depressed. If they didn't have depression, they had no problem with this task. Um, now, this has also been shown in, in, uh, in complicated grief. Paul Bolin and uh, uh, Marcel Vandenhout and uh, Richard Bryant uh, uh, in Australia, a number of uh, people, uh, um, <clears throat> Anne-Marie Golden and Tim Dalgleish, a number of people have found this overgeneral memory in complicated grief. So we're going to extend this in some different ways here. Um, there is, however, a paradox in this with PTSD and with the syndrome of CG. These patients have difficulty retrieving specific memories, but, but the memories of the loss or the trauma, in the case of the PTSD patients, are quite specific and distressing. You have vivid recollections, intrusive memories, and so forth, and yet, when you're asked to perform the AMT, a hard time doing that. Seems to be a bit of a paradox. One possible uh, explanation for this is maybe these uh, prepotent, intrusive memories of the deceased, in this case, make it difficult for subjects with CG to retrieve other specific memories. It sort of gets in, in the way, so to speak, and uh, thereby interfering with the sort of normal retrieval processes that, that occur in folks who do not have these conditions. There might also
also be a role for a working memory capacity here. Uh, if working memory capacity is, for whatever reason, uh, diminished in individuals, uh, if they have less gas in the tank, so to speak, it might be harder for them to do this in an effort to retrieve these specific memories, especially if they're having a lot of uh, intrusive recollections and the like. So what we did, uh, uh, Donna recruited subjects from the, uh, the Cambridge, Boston uh, community uh, who had spousal bereavement. Uh, now we waited uh, uh, for uh, we waited one year after the person had the loss. One to three years was the, the time frame that we used here. As it was a small study, we had um, uh, thirteen complicated grief subjects and twenty uncomplicated grief subjects. And uh, so we uh, were uh, asking the question relative to those with uncomplicated bereavement, those who were scoring very low on. on Priggerson's um, uh, inventory for complicated grief. Uh, well, subjects with CG exhibit uh, difficulty retrieving specific autobiographical memories not involving the deceased partner. So we're thinking maybe this problem is when, when you're not, you're, you're trying to retrieve memories that have nothing to do with the deceased partner, or if you're thinking PTSD, not including the trauma. Now, also, would this extend to the future? You know, it, uh, so well, would it be hard for someone to envision future events, a memory for the future, that is to say, a simulation or prospection of the future, uh, 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 when you're not having the spouse involved? So what we did, so we basically had two cognitive tasks that we ran in our, in our laboratory. Uh, we had the autobiographical memory task, the standard AMT. So you get the keyword, and then you had to retrieve a specific memory, lasting no longer than a day, that either uh, involved your deceased spouse or did not involve your deceased spouse. Okay? Then, uh, 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 for the prospection task, you had to envision the future. You know, think of a specific event that could occur um, with, um, uh, with your spouse, obviously counterfactually, if the spouse had lived. So the person might think of, I can imagine a time uh, next summer where we're, we're walking across the Pont Neuf in, in Paris, and the sun is shining, etc., etc. Of course, the person is, is not here, obviously. So it's, it's a counterfactual prospection versus uh, in, envisioning some event for the future that does not involve the, sp the spouse. So we're trying to look at this going both ways. The reason why we're connecting these is my colleagues Randy Buckner and Dan Schachter shown that uh, a lot of the same brain regions in autobiographical recollection are also implicated when you, when you simulate future scenarios. So it seems like we may have the, some of the same processes that are involved in both cases. We also tested working memory cap capacity with Randall Engel's task where people do a simple arithmetic problem and then answer, uh, is it yes or no? Is the answer correct, yes or no? And then they're given a word, and they have to say the word, you know, chair, out loud. They're given us we progressively a greater number of these problems, and then they have to say back all the words uh, in the order in which they saw them. And, and the more that you can do, the more that you can hold in mind remembering those words, uh, the better your capacity. Okay, so the results. Okay, first of all, what we found here, uh, Okay, there we go. Good. There's, there's my point. Um, this is the uh, this is the autobiographical memory test, the AMT. This is the standard one, um, and uh, the CG subjects are here in the black bars. The control subjects who are bereaved but are doing okay today. Uh, when it comes to retrieving specific memories with your spouse, so this is an episode that involves your spouse. Uh, they're they're very very similar. Both groups are doing they're doing just fine. They're just doing just fine. So it doesn't seem to be a, a general problem with retrieving specific memories overall. Uh, but now, without the spouse, uh, these folks have a harder time doing so relative to the non-bereaved. Okay? So you're, you're given a cue word. When was a particular time when you felt uh, a sad or successful or happy? These are we had uh, uh, four different uh, words of each valence. Um, Think of a specific one that involved, or did not involve your spouse. They have a harder time doing that. Now, now this is the thing I think is the most kind of worrisome. We think about the clinical aspects here. When you're thinking about, uh, now you uh, prospect, you know, to envision a memory of the future, so to speak, with your spouse. Uh, they're actually doing rather well at this task. And I think in this case, you know, this is, uh, this is kind of difficult. Uh, 
uh, because they, they also are fully aware that this person is not available, but they can envision a future with their spouse at the same time knowing full well that it can never happen. Now, and here's the problem here, if you're asked to envision, a, uh, envision a, an event, a scenario without your spouse, they have a very hard time doing that relative to the controls. So they're getting kind of a blank. Okay? <clears throat> now, whoops, there we go. Uh, when it comes to uh, 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 the, uh, the, the AMT here, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the standard AMT test, we also looked at the severity of complicated grief uh, along here, and then looking at the amount of uh, specificity, uh, retrieving uh, uh, memories without your spouse, and if you have high working memory capacity, uh, you, you can actually do pretty well. If you're in the medium, it starts to dip a little bit at high grief. And here, if you've got the, if you're very high in complicated grief, this is quite, quite challenging here. So we get a sense here that the, uh, that uh, restrictions on working memory capacity, uh, <coughs> in the context of the high grief, uh, uh, does in fact seem to get in the way of retrieving memories uh, without your spouse. However, however, uh, when it comes to the, the prospection here, it doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of difference uh, in terms of the working memory capacity. Uh, both the subjects are low, medium, and high. Uh, if you start getting into the high CGN, they're all having some real challenges here in terms of envisioning the future. So, some of the conclusions from this first uh, uh, experiment. Uh, first of all, this ease of counterfactual envisioning could be potentially problematic. We think of this, this uh, very high frequency symptom of yearning after the lost loved one. They, they know this person is gone, and yet they, they can easily, easily envision all these things that they can do with this person. And, and so the, the, the contrast, that discrepancy here, might be a possible cognitive source of, the, of, of this emotional symptom. Now, difficulty envisioning the future without one spouse, you get this, this symptom of the loss of self, that something is gone, right? And uh, difficulty planning for the future, this is a very, very similar sort of a thing. Envisioning a future without your spouse is one uh, aspect of planning for the future, which is a more general phenomenon. But you can see this difficulty of projection without the spouse, prospection without the spouse. And perhaps without a future, Little wonder that someone might say, you know, life seems meaningless since she died or he died. Now, this raises an interesting possibility. As many of you know, there's a lot of work on CBM, cognitive bias modification, and, and you wonder whether there might be a possibility with simulation training, training people to envision the future. Although I might add parenthetically, this can be a touchy subject. I've seen this with Vietnam veterans where they, they felt as if they were to get better, improve, that somehow that, that would mean that they were no longer honoring the memory of their dead comrades. And, and this occasionally comes up with the CG subjects, that, that their suffering is, a, is a, a hallmark of their lasting love. And if, if, they were, if you're going to train me to think about the future without my spouse, that's an insult to the person who's passed away. Some of them will say this, and so it's a t touchy subject, but at least conceptually, it suggests a possible intervention on this problem. Okay, uh, the next experiment, uh, this one here, uh, this is preliminary data, it's, it's mainly done, so I think the story is not going to change much here, I just want to show on emotional reactivity in CG. Um, we know that close relationships can buffer people against stress overall, right, social support. Um, now, would that then render bereaved individuals with special CG hyper-responsive for negative emotions. So if you have lost a source of social support, you're some, a, little, a little more defenseless against the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Um, and so with then, those with the PCPD, complicated grief, show greater negative emotional reactivity than those without it. Now, in this experiment, what we did is we recruited subjects again from the, uh, the Cambridge, Boston area. Uh, this time we broadened our scope, and there's strengths and weaknesses of, 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 of doing that. This was not just spousal bereavement, but it also was the loss of a child, a sibling, or a romantic partner. But um, in conjunction with our, uh, the DSM uh, uh, appendix criteria, uh, they had to be bereaved at least for one year. 
Now, though, uh, right now we're, we're adding the, the remaining subjects with the PCBB group. They're basically folks in uh, relatively young, young middle-aged individuals uh, uh, bereaved with and without PCBD. Now, our inventory for complicated grief, this is the standard measure that's been used in all of the studies prior to the diagnostic criteria being present. Uh, well, we also did assess them with the DSM-5 criteria as well. Now, um, there were two tasks that they did. I'm going to present the emotional film clap, clips task. Um, I'll describe it in a moment. They also did a Trier social stress speaking task, but uh, time considerations preclude me putting this in here. Uh, we, we had uh, four different tasks, uh, excuse me, four different films. And what we did, we consulted a paper by um, James Gross and Bob Levinson in Cognition and Emotion a number of years ago, where these guys took a whole bunch of film clips and they showed them to the University of California undergraduates who rated them in terms of all of these different emotions. And so we picked out the winners, so to speak, in terms of uh, the funniest film clip of all time. Probably can't see that in the back. That's from When Harry Met Sally. Uh, this is the famous faking the orgasm in the restaurant scene, which at least University of California undergraduates find that absolutely hysterically funny. Um, the, uh, the sad scene is from a movie called The Champ. It's about a, a, a boxer who's on a comeback trail and actually dies after a bout in his little boy there. This one here is a wrenching scene, I think, uh, quite frankly. Now, this is, a, this is a scene from the movie The Shining, uh, you know, we, we, I, we, we piloted this informally in my lab, and it, 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 the little boy's going down on his tricycle, and all this, with this ball comes up to him, and he's really getting spooked out. This scared the wits out of the University of California undergraduates. I have no idea why. Uh, so, it, 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 didn't, it didn't do anything for our subject. And finally, a neutral, uh, a neutral scene. So uh, the scary one, uh, this, this did nothing. So uh, it's out of the picture right now. This was worthless. Um, there's other scary scenes in that movie, but hey, whatever. We're just following the data. According to Levinson, it's scary. I don't believe it. Okay, our outcome measures. We had self-report the pre-post visual analog mood scales, physiological arousal, heart rate, skin conductance level, and um, uh, uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is sort of an interesting one. This is measures of heart rate variability and index of parasympathetic uh, uh, activity, uh, the branch of the autonomic nervous system that is... Uh, um, you know, sort of counteracts uh, heart rate and arousal, etc. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of research on this done by psychophysiologists, and um, uh, they, they, they've come to the conclusion that RSA, RSA can provide a couple of indices of good emotional regulation, right? And, and so this would be a challenge in someone who's lost social support, presumably. So if you have a high resting level, high tonic RSA, so you're, you have a lot of heart rate variability normally, that's supposedly a good thing, and it's correlated with all kinds of beneficial outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you also uh, are really in tune to your environment, and so you're responsive, so you have a big a drop, uh, for example, or increase uh, in a response, you react uh, in RSA. Uh, uh, quite pronounced, uh, that also is a good marker of this. So we, so we asked the question, are, are these folks uh, more reactive here? And it turns out, uh, what we see here, and uh, people uh, do respond to the sad clips. There's absolutely no difference. Uh, we did not have a greater reaction here. And uh, this is the, uh, the PCBD subjects. They're not up here. Uh, they're, they're quite close. There's really no difference at all. People do really react uh, to that sad clip, no doubt about it. But the PCB subjects are not more pronounced than the, so we are we're wrong about that. Um, we thought this might, they also might show a less pronounced reaction to the funny clip. But no, both of them, they were, they were both busting out laughing at uh, this one. So they were quite responsive to that. So it wasn't as if they were, had more of a negative reaction to the, the, sad, uh, the sad clip and less of one to the funny one. Uh, they were, were very, very similar. So this, this was, we were wrong on this one. The heart rate, we, we get uh, really no differences here between the neutral, sad, and funny. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the fact the PCB subjects, they had a slightly more non-significant reaction to the, the funny clip. Uh, skin conductance level, however, they're much lower. They're, in terms of the arousal level in the PCB subjects, much lower overall. Uh, and so 
Uh, this is a baseline thing. This has also been seen in PTSD and also in depression, by the way, very low skin conductance. Now, the respiratory sinus arrhythmia was sort of an interesting one. Uh, first of all, uh, again, consistent with what you get in depression, we also see just a lower, lower level of, of our uh, RSA and, uh, and our, whoops, darn it. Our subjects here are our control subjects. Uh, they, they are much more responsive. So when you go to neutral, down to both sad and funny, they react. So they have an emotionally responsive system, so to speak. Uh, whereas our, our PCB subjects, they're not showing that at all. And these, are, uh, these differences are reliable here. Uh, so overall, they don't show greater negative emotional reactivity or blunted positive activity. Uh, but the, the subjects with uh, uh, complicated grief do show lower resting RSA and RSA hyporeactivity. So on the two, two measures of emotional regulation abilities or capacities, they are not doing as well as the subjects who've recovered from the loss of their loved one. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so this is, um, uh, again, uh, suggests p uh, potentially poor or, or impaired emotion regulation. And it's also potentially um, uh, consistent with the numbing symptoms of, PT, uh, of PCBD. Now, uh, one, well, we really don't know, however, whether these people had uh, uh, limitations in these, these physiological measures of um, emotional regulation prior to the loss or not. We, we don't know that. This is cross-sectional. But we do know that they are not doing as well on these measures, so to speak, as are those who have recovered. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears from uh, <coughs> pardon me, uh, experimental uh, work to some of the network analysis research that we've been doing. Uh, the, the methods that we use in network analysis, these were actually developed in early 20th century physics. And what happened to these sort of kind of leapfrog psychology and landed in the field of sociology with social network analysis. So the sort of methods that we're using have been used by the physics guys and the sociologists. The sociologists, of course, they're studying uh, uh, networks of individuals, you know, social relationships, friendship, enemy networks, things of that sort. But uh, <coughs> what we do in psychopathology is uh, the things we study are the nodes, so to speak, are not people, but rather symptoms. Um, uh, Danny Boersboom and his group at the University of Amsterdam, a, a, a fantastic group of investigators, have pioneered the application of these methods to um, the study of psychopathology and personality. And we've, uh, we have a, a paper with Denny's group coming out, uh, the results of which I presented here last year with earthquake survivors at, uh, in clinical psychological science. Uh, the, these are some other data here with childhood sexual abuse survivors that I'll show. And so I'm going uh, to give a little bit of background for those unfamiliar with this and then show how some of this can be illustrated with, with a PTSD symptoms in CSA, childhood sexual abuse survivors. <coughs> the network analysis deals with, uh, of course, symptoms of psycho, psychopathology here. And some observations that we all know uh, is that symptoms of psychopathology don't occur randomly, right? They don't just occur randomly. They don't sort randomly. Uh, some are more likely to occur together than others are. As we say, they tend to cohere syndromically. So, so when we clinicians see lots of different patients displaying all kinds of different symptoms, you get these sort of pattern recognition. You know, people become quite, you know, seasoned clinicians can be quite good at this. You, you know, people say, I get spot a borderline by the third session. You know, you, you know, these things kind of hang together in this way. Now, the question is, why? Right? Why is this the case? I mean, it's sort of all these obvious questions. Why do these things hang together? Right? Uh, and, and network analysis provides a new answer to this very old question. Okay? Well, the standard answer is because they share a common cause, namely the underlying disorder or disease entity. Right? So you got this. That's why these things hang together because they're all reflective of this underlying entity. Now, so the symptoms then are reflective of the disorder, the disease, the underlying entity that produces their emergence and thus their coherence. That is the standard answer. Now this is true whether you happen to be a categorical theorist 
uh, as we have a DSM-5, you got these discrete entities, they all got their own criteria sets and so forth. Or whether you favor a dimensional approach, you say, well, they're all latent symptoms of an underlying dimension of depression, for example. Now, now uh, this particular approach to understanding the connection between uh, indicators and constructs, symptoms and underlying disorder rest upon the axiom of local independence. It's an observation that Danny Borsboom made here. And, he, uh, and, and the idea here is that to, to underwrite uh, an inference to an, a, a, a disorder, a latency that's, un, that's unobserved but is nevertheless productive of all of these symptoms that hang together, the symptoms have to be functionally unrelated once one conditionalizes on the presence of the latent cause. So if you, so if you take that factor out, they're no longer connected. So let me just give two examples of this, one just of an everyday example. So if I were to come into this room and uh, we'll say six thermometers, right? And we have them placed all around the room. And then after a few minutes, we take a look at the mercury readings at all six of them. And lo and behold, we've got 22 degrees. Wow, boy, those things really hang together here, these values do, right? Well, this, this a, makes sense. They're all reflective of the latent energy, you know, the kinetic energy of the room, also known as the temperature. So there's independent cause that makes all of these thermometers show the same value. Now, if I were to take an ice cube and place it on one of these thermometers, temperature would drop. But all of the other thermometers, they're not going to say, oh, geez, we better drop too, right? That didn't happen. They're going to remain the same. That's what we mean by locally independent. So they're totally unrelated to this. Now, to, to move into a medical example, suppose we have a case, this is one that uh, uh, Danny has used as a perfect example of this, is a malignant tumor, right? So you have someone who is coughing a lot, his chest pain, his dyspnea, they can't breathe, and so forth. They're spitting up blood. And so, it may, so you know, oh my goodness, this person's not doing so well. You, you, you give an x-ray and biopsy, and so you find out they have a lung tumor, right? So the lung tumor is the latent entity that is potentially discoverable, right? That is the cause of the symptoms. Very much like the heat in the room is the cause of the covariance of those mercury readings that all say 22 degrees. Now, so the key assumptions of this reflective model, I want to emphasize that this reflective model is the one that's been driving all of our research mine included, uh, 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 on diagnosis and the relationship between symptoms and disorders. So, the underlying entity, the disorder, is the cause of the symptoms that reflect its presence, and that's why we see all these studies on, we got to find the, bio the biological marker for depression or the biological marker for PTSD or whatever. It's important that the disorder is distinct from its symptoms. This is important for this model to hold. For example, like the tumor case, you can have someone who has a malignant lung tumor, and as of yet, they have no symptoms at all. They seem fine. They go to the doctor, routine checkup, and the doctor says, oh my God, you've got this spot on your lungs. So I feel fine, right? So, but notice that this doesn't work for many of our disorders, right? So, so if someone's absolutely free of depression, and you say, well, I hate to tell you, but you're suffering from depression. Me? I feel fine, I feel great. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Or someone who is a trauma survivor, right? Uh, and you say, well, you have an underlying disease entity here, right? But, well, I feel fine. It doesn't make any sense. So, uh, we have, and also we have a failure of the axiom of local independence. What is so funny about this, everybody knows this. We, we sort of operate in these two different worlds. You know, uh, when we uh, formulate our diagnoses and things like this, we, we presuppose that this is wrong, and it is. Consider depression, right? So someone's ruminating a lot, right? They're ruminating, they can't sleep at night. Now hold on, is it for the next traumatic movie, they, then they're tired the next day. These things aren't independent. One's causing the other for crying out loud. And then if you and if you're really tired, you can't concentrate. You can't concentrate. You're not good at work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or PTSD. We have intrusive thoughts, which produce distress, which in turn produce avoidance of reminders. In fact, Marty Horowitz back in the 1970s in the pre-DSM era talked about avoidance and numbing and intrusive thoughts as kind of this oscillating functional relation between them. Or Alan Young, the medical anthropologist, talked about the inner logic of PTSD. The symptoms are interconnected, but this is precisely what is prohibited by 
by the nosological system that underwrites our DSM or the dimensional latent variables as well. So the symptoms